Hello everyone, welcome to our second episode of Ask an Elder. I'm your host, Johnny Searles. With me, I have Pastor Michael Mock and Ruling Elder Harry Emerides. We have your questions and we thank you for sending those in. I want to encourage you to continue sending your questions for Ask an Elder to the Gmail account and continue monitoring the YouTube channel for additional videos and additional resources that you can use to uh, stay connected to the ministry here at Cross Creek. So first we'll pray and then we'll get into your questions. Michael, will you please pray for us? I'd love to. Our most excellent God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We are unworthy servants, but we are thankful that you have, by the powerful Spirit, changed our lives and you have been at work in our hearts. You seek to illuminate our minds. And Lord, one way that you do that, the way you do that is through your word. And we do pray that as we lean upon your word and in dependence on the spirit, we would avail ourselves of your truth as your spirit is a spirit of truth. Pray that we would be edified, that you would be glorified as we handle these various questions. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let's get into our first question. So first we have a question about the Holy Spirit's role in overcoming mental illness. Should born-again believers struggle with mental illness, or if they really are saved, should the mental illness have been cast out upon receiving the Holy Spirit? And I'd like to go to Michael with this one. Well, before I get to uh, a direct answer to the Holy Spirit and casting out, I know uh, there's a couple other questions about demon possession that uh, we'll, we'll tackle as well in just a little bit. Before I do that, um, I want to just mention that we, as a, as a society, and Christians are affected by this as well, we are quick to diagnose someone with a mental disorder. And, and just because we see something that is out of the ordinary, we typically say, well, that person has some kind of mental disorder. And, and there are genuine mental disorders, so don't hear me saying that there, that there aren't, but I would say that Christians and non-Christians alike are, are challenging the whole idea of, or at least many supposed mental illnesses, and even Dr. Alan Francis, he was on the, he was the chief editor of the DSM-4 Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and he said that he has written many of these definitions for mental disorders and he's not found one of them helpful in uh, identifying what conditions are or are not that make up or don't make up a mental disorder. Now of course what, we're, what uh, people are doing is they, they see symptoms and, and those are real manifestations. Uh, they are real descriptions of people's experiences but I would caution us to uh, not be so quick to diagnose, not that I would be one to do that as uh, a minister, and not a, a doctor. But I also want to say that extreme problems are not necessarily mental disorders. There are many examples in scripture of someone who is going through a very serious trial and their body is affected by how they are understanding God and the world and their own trial. Job's grief is an example. And uh, there's demoniac in the New Testament, King Nebuchadnezzar and his beast-like behavior. These people would be quickly uh, diagnosed with some kind of mental disorder. But these were spiritual issues that had a physical manifestation. So. Just because the problem is extreme doesn't necessarily mean that it is a mental disorder. 
But as to the question of uh, if once a person is saved, does that then remove any mental disorder? I don't. I don't see. I don't see how we would expect that or ought to uh, anticipate that with with what the Bible says. You know, physical problems persist uh, even after conversion, after the Holy Spirit has changed a person's heart. There are physical problems. Just because you get saved doesn't mean that you have no physical problems. And we would not expect a, a cancer patient who was an unbeliever while having cancer and then became a believer, we wouldn't expect that person to uh, no longer have cancer. We wouldn't expect that convert that cancer to go away upon conversion. So I don't know why we would necessarily expect some kind of biological, uh, organic problem in the, in the brain, a mental disorder, to then just go away through you know, conversion or even through sanctification. It's not like you would you can just read the disorder away or uh, pray the disorder away. If it's, a, if it's a genuine physical problem, then the Bible says that God, can, God will help you handle those physical problems, those chronic illnesses, those um, very serious trials of the body. We do have bodies that are groaning, we have bodies that are wasting away, and God has promised us His, uh, His, uh, His Spirit, He has promised us His grace, the strength, that even when we are weak in spirit or in body, God can strengthen us by the power of His Spirit. And so, even if you do have a, a mental disorder, you can still uh, lean upon Christ, your Good Shepherd, to uh, go through that valley and to, uh, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, to uh, grow in trust in, in your Lord and Savior and to, uh, to serve the, the body, but you can do good things for your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ even when you are physically afflicted. Thank you, Mike. Our next question will go to Harry, and it's a little bit related to that first question. Um, Harry? Were, there, were they real demons that really possessed someone in the Old Testament? And if so, is demon possession still around, some, around today, and can they be cast out? Before you answer, Harry, I'd, li I'd like to give a little bit of background on this question. Um, there were many times in the Gospels and the New Testament where people were described as being demon-possessed. And the question was, uh, written to us uh, that the the asker of the question has often heard pastors say that the demon was that was cast out was not really a demon but was actually Jesus healing a mental illness such as schizophrenia and that's what leads this person to ask were these real demons that really possessed someone and if so is demon possession still around today and can they be cast out okay well I think the first question we need to answer is you know are demons real and demons are real. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, were these um, possessions that we see in the apostolic age, were they real? And I think the answer to that is yes. But I think we need to be very careful here about the conclusions and the doctrines that we draw based on the narratives of Scripture. This was a unique time in redemptive history. Um, when Jesus came and lived on the earth and died and was resurrected, and the period of time immediately after that was very unique. That's when God was laying the foundations for His church. That was long awaited through the Old Testament promises. The Messiah has now come, and God is establishing His church. So there were occurrences and events that were happening during this time that are not normative for the Christian church today. And this is one of these instances. So what was God doing with these occurrences of demon possession? Well, I think to answer that question, we should take a step back. And we should take a step back and consider what is sin. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death. Right? But it's not just the physical death that we're speaking about here, although that's part of it. 
But much more importantly, it's a spiritual death. That those who sin, which is all of us are born into sin, we are rebels. We are rebellion against God. And the consequence of that is spiritual death. That if we are not redeemed, standing before God, we will be come under the judgment of God in wrath. Paul also tells us in Ephesians 2 that, and you, this is chapter 2, verses 1, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So, although fallen man is created in the image of God, ethically, by their actions, fallen man more imitates the devil than they do God. Okay. Elsewhere we see in the biblical accounts that um, in one, let's go to John chapter 8 verses four, uh, verse 44. This is Jesus speaking. You are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies." So what we see here is that fallen man uh, more imitates the devil than God. And so what is going on here during this time with demon possession? Well, what does Jesus come to do? He comes to save man, right? He comes to redeem his people. Well, how does he do that? Well, way back in Genesis 3, what do we have is the, you know, the first gospel, where the gospel was preached to Adam. And God said that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the servant. So Jesus is the head crusher. He has come to undo the works of the devil and redeem his people. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 tells us, He has delivered us, he, Jesus, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Then we can also go to 1 John, chapter 3, verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And we can also go to Mark chapter 3, verses 26 to 27. And this is Jesus speaking. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. So what we see here is that Jesus is coming to undo the works of the devil. Okay, to undo, to undo the, the curse that man is on because of sin. So what we have in the New Testament and the apostolic age with these demon possessions is a visible manifestation of the power of God over Satan. These events give testimony that Jesus is God, that he has the power of God. And it's given to us in a very demonstrative way to show us who Jesus is and what he has come to do. And likewise, in the apostolic age, in the time immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection, we have um, the authority that Jesus has given to his apostles. It's called apostolic authority. So now his apostles, now laying the foundations of his church, also have that power. And it's a visible manifestation that they are indeed commissioned and sent by Christ to establish his church. And what does Jesus say about that church? In Matthew 16, verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. So, um, to go back to that follow-up, is demon possession still around today, and can they be cast out? Okay, well that's a good question. I think um, for the, we'll go back to um, Colossians chapter 1, the first part of this answer. The first part is, as believers, uh, we can say unequivocally that they cannot be demon-possessed. And 1 Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. 
He, Jesus, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. That is a finished work. But also I think for non-believers, I think it's, even for non-believers, it's best to answer that question as, in terms of not demon possession, but demon oppression. The demons oppress people, not necessarily possess people. Well, how can we say that? Well, if we look at the New Testament, beyond that, beyond that apostolic age, where we had the apostles laying the foundation of the church, we have the pastoral epistles, where Paul is writing now to the post-apostolic church, the young churches that he has planted. And he's given his pastors advice and instruction on doctrine and how to run his church. We don't have a, um, a doctrine on how to cast out demons. It's just not present. What do we have? Um, we don't have a call to call demons out of men, but we have a call to call men to repentance. Mm -hmm. The focus is not on demons. The focus is on sin. The focus is on a man's heart the need to be reconciled to Christ. That is what the focus is. I think in, our, in some circles today, there's a tendency when we see um, sin that we may tend to say, well, that's you know, the work of the devil or, or a demon possession or something along these lines. Mm -hmm. But what we need to do is call man to repent of that sin right. and to be reconciled to Christ. Right. And if we go to Ephesians 6, where it's a place in the New Testament where Paul is directly addressing um, spiritual matters, things of the, the work of the devil. And if, we, if we go to that, chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, I'm just going to read that, okay? Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For, who, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So here we have Paul addressing the church, and he's speaking directly to matters of uh, spiritual concern, the work of the evil one, the work of Satan. Okay, And what is Paul telling the church here? What is he encouraging them to do? He's not calling men... Um, de demons out of men. He's not saying that. It's very ordinary means that we see here. What do we see? We see putting on the belt of truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. These are very ordinary means, mm -hmm. which is how we're supposed to go into spiritual battle. Right. And ultimately, in the end, there's two types of people, right? Those that are still in their sin and those that have been redeemed by Christ. And for those that are still in their sin, non-believers, ultimately, their biggest problem is not Satan. In the end, the biggest problem is God. Right. Thanks for that answer, Harry. Uh, moving on to our next question. Uh, why do we have different translations of the Bible? What's the difference between them? And why are some better than others if it's all the true Word of God? And I'll give this one to Michael. That's a, a great question, and a lot can be said about that. A lot can be said in answer to that question. First, I think we should uh, not miss the opportunity to thank God for the many translations that we have. This, we do have so many good English translations that God has blessed us with. And too often we take for granted that the Word of God has been translated to us. So we hear His Word, we read His Word in our own language. What a blessing that is. And we can be thankful for all those various translations that have, uh, have given us the Word of God in uh, you know, 
in our in our English language. And well, I think there are many reasons why there are there's more than one translation. Yes, the the Bible is the Word of God, and but but there are different reasons for why uh, we have the ESV. Uh, English Standard Version, or the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, and all these other translations. Now, one reason, very practical reason, is uh, money and mm -hmm. publishing rights. And there are publishing companies that want to, want their own translation that they can use throughout all their literature. So you have Crossway, for instance, that uses the ESV and uh, Zondervan with the NIV and its various versions. So that's one reason, uh, but that's not the, I wouldn't say that's the ultimate reason because one publishing company wants to have the, the rights to a particular translation so they create their own. Okay, the, the, we have, they have good motives that they want to bless people with God's word in English. And it, of course in, in any translation that, uh, that the Bible exists. There are there are different translation theories and different translation approaches. There's one that's called the formal view or formally equivalent view. And that's trying to get the form of the original as, as closely uh, rendered in the target language, in, in the language that we're reading, in, in English, for instance. And that's more of a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, perhaps then that they are trying to, um, if there are say five words in Greek, maybe they're trying to put those five words in Greek as literally as possible, maybe even in five words in, in English or, or around there. So it's, it's, the intent is to be as most literal to the form and try to be less interpretational. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then there's a functional or a dynamic equivalent view, that's more thought for thought. So there's more license given in uh, getting the sense of the passage and then putting that sense in as many words, say in English, that would be necessary to communicate the idea rather than the actual uh, form itself. And so there's a whole spectrum of, of versions that this would fall under. So you have um, in the, the formal equivalent view, you would have something like the, uh, the King James Version or uh, the, the ESV. Something more in the functional, dynamic equivalent view, that would be more like the New Living Translation. That would be on the, the far end of that spectrum. Somewhere close to that, uh, functional would be like the New International Version, the NIV. So, there are different translations because there are different approaches. These translation theories, they, they think that it's better to render, some, render the form, and others say it's better to render the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course we have different translations because of different levels of understanding in age groups. Um, it's the, the New Living Translation, for instance, would be easier for someone who has just come into the faith and is uh, not used to, say, King James English. Mm -hmm. Different levels of understanding, different age groups uh, would be another reason for different translations. And what's better? Well, objectively I would say uh, a better translation is, or the best one is, that, is the translation that best represents the words of God in the original. Mm -hmm. And in my view, that, that's more of a formal, uh, a formal translation view. And because, again, that there's less interpretation going on and more uh, trying to render, this is what God says in the original Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. So we're going to put that as closely as possible, as literally as possible, into English. Now, subjectively, what's the best? Well, I think... Um, it's the, the best translation for you is the one that helps you to understand God's Word the best. And I would say even one that challenges you 
to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, as a final comment here, that you should, as a, as a reader of the Bible, challenge yourself to uh, challenge yourself with, with uh, harder versions, not, not versions that you won't understand, but they, they can stretch your understanding. And then even, uh, I would say, try as much as you could to, to even pick up one of those original languages. And it's, it's not, the original languages are not just for seminarians or for uh, pastors. It's, you can, uh, and I, I hear testimony after testimony of people who aren't studying God's Word to become ministers or seminary professors who study the Word of God in the original and they are blessed by it. And it takes a lot of work, to be sure, but it can be done. And so I would challenge you to, to perhaps even consider that as a worthwhile endeavor. After all, it is God's Word and it is worthy of our attention. Amen. Thank you for that answer, Michael. Um, just a quick follow-up, where would you put uh, a translation like the message in those, in those different views you laid out? How, where would something like the message fit in? That's a good, that's a good question. It's interesting because the message uh, written by Eugene Peterson, who's now with the Lord, uh, uh, when Eugene wrote that, he specifically said it is not a translation. Okay. He said it is a paraphrase. So he would encourage you to read the message alongside the Bible. Okay. So it's, it's uh, if it were called a translation, it would be the farthest on the functional equivalent. Right. But it's so, it's so interpretive that even the original author didn't intend it to be used as a standalone Bible translation. Correct. And I know that's a, I'm glad you weighed in on that because that's a, a controversial, when people view it as a translation, it does create controversy. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Next, for questions, we will move on to a question about the sacraments. <clears throat> and we'll go back to Michael with this one. As to the sacraments, who is eligible and under what context is it appropriate to administer each sacrament? For instance, should a layman baptize their own child? Okay, so we're talking about the administration of the sacrament. So the who and the when. Mm -hmm. or where, when and where. The who, uh, I think the Bible is very clear, and our Westminster Confession of Faith summarizes this as well. The who is only a lawfully ordained minister. Only that person is qualified to administer the sacraments. Now we're talking about the two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In the Confession of Faith, chapter 27, paragraph 4, there be only two sacraments ordained by Christ our Lord in the Gospel, that is to say, baptism and the Supper of the Lord, neither of which may be dispensed by any. So, you can't just pick anybody you want to administer the sacrament, but by a minister of the Word lawfully ordained. And then, in the section, chapter 29, Paragraph 3, section of the Lord's Supper, says, The Lord Jesus hath in this ordinance appointed his ministers to declare his word of institution to the people, to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine, and thereby to set them apart from a common to a holy use, and to take and break the bread, to take the cup, and they, communicating also themselves, to give both to the communicants, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. So we have the ministers who are giving the word of God and giving the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is the testimony of Scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Jeremiah 3.15, God tells Jeremiah that he's going to give the, the people in the New Covenant shepherds who will feed God's people with God's word. And in Hebrews 5, 4, you don't just become a priest because you self-identify as a priest. You can't self-appoint 
as a priest. You, in order to become a priest, you have to be called by God to offer those sacrifices. It's a, it's a calling that God has laid upon ministers. Uh, Matthew 28, 19, Christ, he, he gives the word to his apostles, tells them to teach everything that he commanded, to baptize, disciple the nations. And that's given then to the church leaders. Uh, Harry had, had, had spoken about the post-apostolic church, the, the church leaders who are uh, taking over um, the, the teachers who are added to that foundation of the prophets and apostles. You know, Paul himself, as a minister of the New Covenant, he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 20-23, that he received from the Lord the, the teaching, the Word of God, and the, uh, the administration of the, the Lord's Supper. He, gave, he was given that authority by Christ. And one more text of Scripture here, 1 Corinthians 4.1, uh, says that the ministers of the New Covenant are stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, the sacraments are, in one sense, mysteries of, of God. And, they, and the Lord has given ministers the authority to steward these sacramental mysteries to God's people. So, because ministers are entrusted with the Word of God, and, and because the sacraments are visible words of the Lord, they are the Word in uh, visible form, uh, because of this, it's, it should just be the ministers who are giving the, uh, the, the sacraments. They're the ones who are lawfully ordained. In our denomination, you know, we have a church, a local body, calling a minister and that, or calling someone to be its minister, and then the, the presbytery uh, examines that candidate and says yes or no, and if it says yes, then, then now there's that formal acknowledgement, that recognition that this person has been entrusted with the Word of God to feed God's people with. So uh, you have to be a one that's lawfully ordained. Other denominations do it differently. Uh, but there needs to be some kind of formal recognition that this person is going to be the, the minister of the, of the Word of God so that he can then also minister the sacraments. So, uh, you know, your, your four-year-old who baptizes, uh, you know, a two-year-old in a tub of water, whether it's by immersion or sprinkling or pouring, even with the, you got the water, and even if that four-year-old uh, says, the words of institution, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's not a, a, a true valid baptism. Likewise, say there's a, a band of, of brothers, a 14-year-old who has seemed to be very charismatic and who loves the Bible. Uh, they're doing some Bible study and they say, hey, you know what? You, you are our leader. Why don't you lead us in the Lord's Supper? Well, that's not true uh, administration of the Lord's Supper. He's not someone who's lawfully ordained. He's not a minister of the gospel. So what he does is not a true giving of the Lord's Supper. A giving of the Lord's Supper isn't just the who, but it's also the when and the where, the, the context. And the Bible is clear uh, that it's that the Lord's Supper and baptism takes place in the present embodied gathering of the church that's been uh, there for the sole purpose of worshiping God. So, um, going back to the um, chapter 29 of the Confession, the last part says that the ministers are giving the Lord's Supper to, to those who are there, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. 1 Corinthians 11.20 is the chapter about the Lord's Supper, and he says, when you come together, come together for what? For, for worship, for um, glorifying God, by hearing his word preached. Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, on Sunday, they came together when they gathered to break bread. They gathered for the purpose of worship, and that involved 
breaking bread. So going to uh, going to church, gather together, embodied, not virtual, digital. Um, you're here together for the purpose you hear the word of God preached, and and then you hear, then you can partake of. The Lord's Supper. In fact, there's a reason that the Lord's Supper comes after the Word of God preached because you cannot have the Lord's Supper uh, um, ripped apart from the preaching since it's a visible Word. Amen. I think uh, part of your answer goes back to authority and the, the greater context within that is that uh, a lot of parts of the church today don't, don't seem to uh, see the church as an authority in the same way that we once did. Um, sometimes we don't see that even our own government is, is uh, somehow ordained by God to be in authority, whether they're right or wrong. Um, Part of the confession said a lawfully ordained mm -hmm. um, minister, and I think that's when we, when we think of a minister who's been called. Not all um, not all denominations or all churches treat the church's ordination as a lawful ordination. Um, so there there might be something lost in that too. That might that might be why it might seem to some believers that. I can baptize my own children, or I can take communion at home. Um, maybe we're at the right time, or the Lord's Day in the morning, and uh, we have a small gathering of believers, a family. But what's missing is the right concept of a lawful, lawfully ordained minister. So that's that's something you said that uh, that I think some parts of the church might be missing or misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there will always be some denominational differences, and we certainly can't solve those all during this episode. Indeed. <laughs> Moving on to our final question. Th this question has a, a lot of details that we won't be able to address in this one episode, although we would like to. Um, and I encourage the writer of this question to continue to send in more questions. Um, maybe we can take on some of these concepts in a future episode. But the heart of the question is, how do we explain that not all of the Bible should be taken as a direct command for us today? So, some of the Bible tells us what to do, some of the Bible tells us what not to do, but much of the Bible is narrative uh, for a believer today, reading back what happened to Israel, for example, we're not necessarily the hero in the narrative. Um, and I think the general concept to start addressing this question is that the Bible isn't about us, or at least not about us exclusively. The Bible is about what God, what God has done, what God, God will continue to do. So it would be easy thinking if you start with the presumption that the Bible is about us, it would be easy to somehow think that in the story of David and Goliath, for example, you're David and your life problems are Goliath. But we know from the narrative of David and Goliath and from other parts of the Bible that, that help us understand this passage that we're not David. Um, if anybody's David, Jesus is David. And um, Goliath isn't, you know, our day-to-day -day problems. Um, Goliath is our sin. Um, just, just as an example, um, we can't take we can't take this uh, we can't over allegorize parts of the Bible to be about us when we shouldn't. Um, but I think I think to just to get the right start on this question. I'd like to ask Harry to read 2 Timothy 3.16. Sure. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Thank you, Harry. Um, so back to the proposition that the Bible isn't about us, it's about what God, what God has done, what God will continue to do. Um, we need to have the right hermeneutic uh, that to really understand passages that were written at a different time than we live today to a different audience. We need to know something about that audience. We need to know what the original meaning of that passage was to that audience. And then we can derive what the meaning is for us today. Sometimes it's pretty simple. Uh, a passage like the Ten Commandments, it probably meant to the original Hebrew audience what it means to us today. Very, basically the same. Uh, we're told not to do certain things, and we're told to do certain things. And we can bring those forward to the church today. Um, they apply, the Ten Commandments are a good example of a passage of Scripture that applies to all of God's people all the time. Right, in the Bible, and we say that the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments is a summary of the moral law that is written on our hearts, right? Right. Um, to, to move on with a little bit of uh, helpful guidance related to this question, I want to reference an article on a website called thegospelcoalition.org, and the title of the article is Five Ways to Read the Bible for Personal Application. And this article does a good job of breaking down these different categories. Um, and they start by saying, the Bible is a book about God, not a book about us. But as Harry referenced in the scripture, it's all written for us and for our benefit that we might understand. So the first category that the article lays out is direct commands. And that's an example of, the Ten Commandments are an example of direct commands. We also have Jesus telling us um, to, to believe. Uh, we have Paul telling us to repent and believe. Mm -hmm. The second category of the article gives us a general truths. Um, so these are broadly applicable in a variety of situations. And an example is in, uh, in Matthew 22, when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's a general truth. Um, that can apply generally to believers, even if you don't have Caesar, you have whatever your government is, mm -hmm. it still applies to you to, to uh, obey the laws of the government or to pay your taxes or whatever that instance is. The third category they lay out is direct analogy. The, and this is where it can get a little bit, a little bit when, we, when we put ourselves in the wrong part of the direct analogy. So this can be controversial. Um, but the article defines direct analogy as those actions of persons and groups that are to be judged morally wrong, which are similar to actions that are judged to be wrong or against God's will under similar circumstances in Scripture or are discordant with actions judged to be right, or in accord with God's will in Scripture. So in direct analogy, if we see that something was wrong in the Bible, though not directly commanded to be wrong, uh, we can understand whether it's wrong today uh, through, through, an, through an example. Um, Would an example of that be, for instance, uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, when you have uh, Paul speaking against that, the, the church in Corinth because they are not disciplining the man who has his stepmom. Uh, and then you know, there's that prohibition, you, know, you guys shouldn't be doing this, and you're, you're arrogant, and right. you're not sad about this. Well, our church might not have that going on, right? but uh, does that mean that the text has nothing for us about that particular issue? No. In fact, even Paul says, you know, uh, avoid all this sexual morality. Right. I think that's a great example. Another example from Corinthians would be serving the Lord's Supper rightly. Um, related to the question that uh, you took on a moment ago. The Corinthians were uh, over-serving and gluttonous and selfish. Um, the way we serve communion in our church, you would have a hard time being selfish 
uh, in, in an overt way, right. but you might still have those same errors uh, in your belief or in your approach to the Lord's table. Um, you might be making a similar uh, error that the Corinthians were making, even though it's not, it doesn't look like um, selfishness in the way that you receive the supper. Um, so I think that's another direct analogy. Another category the article provides for us is indirect analogy. And this is when a passage teaches by example instead of a specific stated rule. Uh, and there is some, a little bit of crossover, direct analogy, indirect analogy. Uh, so these aren't hard and fast categories. They're just a helpful guide. Um, but think of when we look to Old Testament narratives to learn how we should or should not act. Um, Joseph and Potiphar. That's, that's an indirect analogy. But we know from that story that we should flee from um, adultery and immorality. Uh, this is where they, as I said a moment ago, the, the article makes this point too, that we have to be careful not to take that application too far. That, that doesn't mean it's the primary purpose of that narrative in the Bible. It's, it's only there as an analogy. That's not necessarily true. And then the final category is indirect extension. And I actually really like this category um, because most of Scripture fits into it. If you're reading a genealogy, um, you might have a hard time finding a direct command, um, a direct analogy, an indirect analogy, or even a general truth from genealogy. But places in the Bible, like genealogies, they help the Bible self-authenticate its message. When we know the genealogical connection from David to Jesus, we see how Jesus fulfills the claims of the Messiah or the, the expectations of the Messiah. And there's actually another article that helps us understand this category even better. It's on the same website, thegospelcoalition.org, and it's called 10 Reasons the Old Testament is Important for Christians. So when, you're, when we talk about the Old Testament in particular, um, I hadn't really considered this, but it was Jesus' only scripture, um, which sounds obvious saying it, but... Um, that means when Jesus arrived on the scene in the flesh, this was the, this was the full understanding of God's word at the time. Um, and it told the indirect extension parts of the Old Testament, told God's people what to look for and how they would know the Messiah had arrived. Um, and that's actually why I think that's a, a special category that we often overlook. Um, because of genealogies, prophecy. If the believer today has too much of a tendency to kind of flip through and find a, a life verse or a verse that, you know, you can do that in the Proverbs. You can find something that you can maybe focus on uh, and pray about and want to, a category of your life you want to improve. Um, but there is a tendency to go to prophecies that are specifically about Israel or specifically about the Messiah and to somehow make those a life verse or a, a personal claim today. Um, and I think that's where we have to be careful um, that the purpose of that scripture was to authenticate the Messiah. That way we know what he says is true and reliable. So when Jesus says, trust in me and your sins will be forgiven, we have this whole you know, historical catalog of, right. of verses that and chapters that that give us uh, confidence that his message is true. Um, did either of you guys have any more thoughts on this question about what what parts of uh, the Bible should be taken as a direct command, or maybe what hermeneutic we should use? You know, John, I think another way to approach this question is to look at it through the lens of covenant theology. Okay, right? absolutely. God is a God advances his kingdom through various covenant administrations, right? For example, we have the Mosaic Covenant, and that's a covenant administration. And we have various laws and stipulations that accompany that covenant, which are no longer applicable to us. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we just skip that part of our Bible? No. What did the 2 Timothy say? All scriptures, God-breathed and profitable. Well, 
although we do not sacrifice animals anymore, how is that profitable to us? Well, it really um, fulfills and really enriches our Christology and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, what he came to do, to offer himself as atonement for our sins. All those things, um, if we had not had that in our Bible, we would have a, um, a less view of the work of our Savior. Right? It really enriches our, our view of Jesus Christ and what he has done. We'd be surprised to see all of a sudden Jesus crucified right. on the cross right. and being called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Exactly. So there is more in that question that we simply don't have time for today. Um, and if there are other questions out there that haven't been answered fully or um, you know you maybe forgot to send it in, send in your questions. We'll continue to address those questions in future episodes. Please visit the YouTube channel um, so that you can find more resources. And we'll link those two articles that you referenced, we'll put those in the description so that they can just click on them and find them. Great. Um, and then the email is pastorsofccprez at gmail.com. And what's the YouTube channel? Pastors of Cross Creek Presbyterian. Okay. Well, there you have it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you for sending in your questions. Continue to do so. Um, we really appreciate the uh, level of enthusiasm and uh, the questions that are coming in. It's challenging to answer these questions, and we want to be there as a, a resource and a guide for um, all of God's people at Cross Creek Presbyterian Church. Um, that's all we have for today, and we look forward to doing another episode.